Okay. In this unit, we're going to continue with our common law, civil law comparison. So let's begin with a question. What is the role of the judge in the courtroom in the two traditions? We've said that the common law, the heart of the common law legal tradition, was judge-made law. I've asked my students to replace that phrase in their mind with the phrase, the common law. So let's look at the role of the judge in this legal tradition. But let's begin with the civil law. What is the role of the judge in the civil law tradition? The role of the judge in the civil law tradition is everything. It's her courtroom. She determines the order of the deposition of witnesses, the presentation of evidence. She instructs the lawyers in the process of deliberation. It's her courtroom. By contrast, the role of the judge in the common law tradition may surprise you. But you know this tradition. You've seen it on television. The role of the judge in the common law tradition, in addition to the fact that it truly is judge-made law, it's still her courtroom. But her role is that of referee. She makes sure it's a fair fight, because it truly is a fight. We refer to the civil law tradition as the inquisitorial tradition, the questioning tradition. But we refer to the common law tradition as the adversarial tradition, because it is a fight. And you've seen this on television. You've seen one lawyer respond to something that the opposing counsel has said by saying, I object, Your Honor. And she may say, overruled or sustained. So the common law truly is an adversarial tradition. It really is a fight in front of the judge and or a jury. Now, what's particularly interesting about the adversarial nature of the common law tradition is that this adversarial nature actually filters its way down into the classroom. How does it do so? Well, first year law school, the first year of the study of law in the United States of America has a tendency to be a somewhat stressful experience. Now, it's stressful for a couple of reasons, and I'll explain that in a minute, but let me describe for you the environment. In first year classes, in law school in the United States of America. The students are assigned a seat that they must sit in throughout the entire year. And each professor is provided with a seating chart. And this seating chart is actually a visual representation of what she sees when she looks up at the class in front of her. There are little tiny photographs of each of us in the exact location where our assigned seat is located. And she uses this seating chart, employing the Socratic method, to ask questions of each of us. Now, when she asks the question, she doesn't ask us by our first name. She wouldn't say, Scott, what do you think about this? No. She refers to us by our last names, our family name, Mr. Wishard, in my case. So she might say, Mr. Wishard, what do you think of this concept? Please elaborate. And in some law schools in the United States, when the professor asks you a question, you must stand up, and you may not look at your notes. In other classrooms in the United States and other law schools in the United States, you are not required to stand up, but you still may not look at your notes. In other law schools in the United States, you are not required to stand up, and you may look at your notes. Now, 
I am from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I'm a graduate of my hometown law school. I'm a graduate of the University of Pittsburgh. And at Pitt, we were not required to stand up, and we may look at our notes. And yet, the experience within the classroom was so stressful for some of us that for some of our more demanding professors, my classmates, some of my classmates, were in the bathroom before class with stomach problems. Now, why? Why is the classroom in the study of law during the first year of law school in the United States so stressful? Are American law professors sadistic? Maybe just a little. But no, the reality is that this artificial environment is created to ensure that we experience a stressful environment and learn to cope with it. It's the adversarial tradition. When you step into a courtroom in the United States of America, you don't step into the courtroom unprepared because it's a fight. If you step into the courtroom unprepared, opposing counsel will eat you for lunch. So you go prepared. You go prepared and you enter the courtroom to represent your client as you would yourself with every ounce of your being. That's our tradition. And at times it can be stressful. But stop and think about it. If the judge asks you a question, you're not going to say to her, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, your honor, um, uh, I have the answer. Just, uh, just, just a minute. I'll... No. no. She asks a question, you respond. You're on the mark when called upon. And if not, opposing counsel will be there ahead of you. So the adversarial tradition filters its way all the way down into the classroom. It's part of our training as lawyers. But what about the civil law tradition? What is the civil law? It's, it's not adversarial, as we've said. we said it's inquisitorial. It's questioning. One might argue it's more civil, the civil law. But in many ways, it really is legislative law. And that's a very different process. Now, we have legislative law in the United States of America as well. We call it statutory law, product of our Congress. But in the civil law tradition, in the continental tradition of civil law here in Europe, legislative law is a very different process in many ways. Like all legislative processes, it's a process of negotiation, deliberation, and compromise. So the civil law tradition has very different antecedents. The civil law and the common law, interestingly enough, in one of the earlier years of my time as a professor, one of my students raised her hand and asked the following question. She said, the civil law versus the common law, which is better? Now, I have to admit, I, I didn't expect the question. Um, but it's a fair one and an interesting one. But the answer to the question is that it's very much like comparing apples to oranges. Each are equally good, if you will, equally tasty. Each performs what they have set out to do with equal success. But they do so very differently. So let's take a look for a moment, if you will, at their strengths and weaknesses. Surprisingly enough, the strengths of each legal tradition are also their weaknesses. Let's speak first about the civil law tradition. As we said, civil law tradition is a process of deliberation, negotiation, and compromise. And this takes time. But it's a product of many minds working together, and it's consistent. By contrast, the common law tradition, which we said is law coming out of the courtroom, and we've said historically 
that the common law, tra the common law tradition evolved through the court system, going all the way back to King William's itinerant court in the British Isles. So the court in the common law tradition responds to people's problems. And because it's only a judge or a panel of judges, arguably it's a faster process. It has a tendency to be a little more speedy than the legislative process of the civil law tradition. So one might argue that speed was a strength of the common law tradition. But if you examine it more closely, you realize that this strength, its speed, is also a potential weakness. Because the reality is that because law is coming out of a courtroom on a particular day, two courts addressing largely the same question of law, the same issue, with largely similar facts within the same jurisdiction could come up with opposing opinions. And when this occurs, we call this a split, a judicial split, when this occurs, in essence, we have no law because the opinions of the two justices cancel each other out. Now, this is a weakness. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. And when this occurs, there's recourse to the next higher court, the appellate process. So the appellate court looks at the opposing opinions, decides which direction is the best for the law to evolve in, and the appellate court resolves the split. So for the common law, speed is a strength, but it's also a weakness. For the civil law tradition, Speed is not an element. We require more time to legislate. So that might arguably be a weakness. It takes longer for the legislature to respond to society's needs. But I would argue the other side of that coin, its strength, the civil law's strength, is its continuity. Again, it's the product of many minds, and hopefully these minds collectively can create a more consistent body of law over time. Now, again, the common law tradition is consistent but has this potential for error. Speed, the strength of the common law tradition, also its weakness when we have judicial splits, continuity being the strength of the civil law tradition with the potential criticism that it takes longer for the legislative process to complete itself. All right. Our next unit, we will explore the common law tradition in even more depth as we look to the sources of the common law and explore something that we refer to as the common law methodology. Yes, Professor. My question is about um, the phrase, we the people. Uh, I wanted to know what is the extent of this concept and also is it a message to the world at large in a way saying that monarchy will not rule or is it more a message to the people reminding them constantly that that they ha they have the power very good very good question well those first three words of the US Constitution we the people um, are a little bit of both Actually, it states very clearly uh, to the world that uh, we shall have no monarch. But it is a reminder to the people that they hold the power. Now, interestingly enough, three years later, three years after the ratification of the U.S. Constitution in 1788, in the year 1791, the Bill of Rights was passed. The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, and they embody language that even more clearly states the rights of the people. Now, we should recall that the U.S. Constitution was a compromise. 
It was a deliberation during a very difficult time between the northern colonial states, the newly independent states, and the newly independent southern states. So it was a compromise, and there were a lot of things that some delegates wanted to include in the original US Constitution that others felt they couldn't accomplish at this time. So they negotiated, they deliberated, they reached a consensus on what they could agree upon, and that agreement is embodied in the US Constitution. Three years later, they amended it. And these first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights as they are known, has another answer for you in the 10th Amendment. The US Constitution begins with the three words, we the people. But the 10th Amendment, the last amendment in the original 10 Amendments of the Bill of Rights in 1791, end with three other words. And those three other words are to the people. The 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution reads as follows, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited it to it by the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Let me read that one more time. I stumbled on it. The power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. So we have clearly embodied in the Constitution of 1788 and the first 10 amendments to the US Constitution in 1791. This concept of governance by the people and for the people. A declaration to the world that we shall have no monarch, very certainly. But a continual reminder on a daily basis that the power rests in their hands. It's a good question. Thank you.